As fun and flirty Scandi band Abar once said, Money, 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 must be funny, I have no money. Oh no, board games are many things, fun, an aid for developing confidence, other social skills, strategic thinking, and they're the best reason to meet up with your friend group outside of interventions. One thing that they are not is cheap. Cardboard costs money, kids, and especially with board games doing super well on Kickstarter, game developers feel more obliged now than ever to pack their boxes with lots of plastic bits and bobs that pushes overheads way up. The average cost for a quote, proper board game is between 30 and 50 quid, and because profit margins on games are thinner than a razor on keto, you rarely see much of a price drop over time like you would with, say, video games. Look at this game! It's so cheap, someone will say to you, skin mottle, because they can't afford soap. It's only 20 pounds! It's a drug habit if drugs were also really big and you had to find a place to put all your drugs once you've bought them. However, despite this intimidating state of affairs, there are still some games out there that will provide you with big fun for a tiny price tag. This is a collection starter, and here are 10 great board games that only cost 10 bucks. Shipping not included in that tenor, because if you can, shop at your local board game store. They need you. Again, there are no margins in board game. Number 10. Bandido, a little game that needs to be played on a big table. Bandido is a charming card laying game where you and other players have to stop this adorable little criminal from escaping through a series of underground tunnels. You start with three cards, then you play one, connecting it to the tunnels already on the board, then you take a card. If you block off all the tunnels with torches, you win. If you run out of cards and there are still open tunnels, the Bandido has escaped and you lose. That's it, that's the whole thing. But it's really addictive, getting so, so close to locking him in, then you get one bad hand Hand of cards and suddenly, oh no, it's broken. Things can go from fine to mega death very quickly in Bandido, and yes, it's a deck of cards, so it's very luck based. But the game's so light and one more goish that you get a lot of play out of a tiny box. You can even play it all by yourself, just trying to keep that cute criminal down. What did the Bandido actually do? Pet murder. Oh no. Number nine, cockroach poker or Kakalakan poker if you're German, or one of those people who refer to things by their original foreign names. My Hero Academia, never heard of it. Big fan of Boku no Hero Academia though, you f***ing asshole. Point is, cockroach poker is really good. Personally, in terms of most amount of plays versus amount of money spent, this game is probably the most value for money in my entire collection. You have a hand of these bug cards which manage to make gross egg laying soil dwellers look cute like your mum does, and each go you pass them to each other face down whilst claiming what they are. I pass this card to Jeff and say, this is a toad. I might be lying. If Jeff says, that's not a toad, and I turn it over and it is, Jeff is wrong, so he keeps it in front of him. But if I was lying, I keep it. Or if he wants, Jeff could not call me, look at the card himself, then pass it to another player also saying what it is. Sheila, Adam was lying. It's not a toad. It's actually a cockroach. And you can definitely trust me. I'm Jeff. The aim of the game is to engineer it so that one player gets four of the same type of card in front of them, at which point they are the loser. It's a simple bluffing system, but it's one of the most fun, interactive, laugh out loud games on the market. And for under 10 bucks, it's an absolute bargain. Number eight, Sushi Go. Board games can make anything cute. Pet murderers, check. Toads, check. Raw fish, that's a double check. Look at these little sods. Almost make me not want to grind them into paste with my big teeth. Almost. Depending on the number of players, you get a bunch of cards. You take one and you play it and then you pass the rest of your cards to your neighbor. You get the remaining cards from your other neighbor, you keep one of those, you play it and you pass it again. So on and so on until all the cards have been played. The amount of points you get will depend on how many of each type of card you have because each card scores differently. The cute dumplings just give you more points for having more of them. The cute pudding only gives you six points for having the most but penalizes you six if you have the least. The sashimi are worth absolutely nothing until you have three three of them and then there's suddenly 10 whopping points. Do you take risks on completing a risky set? Because remember, you don't know what cards your neighbor will pass to you in future goes. Plus everyone knows that you're going for sashimi so they might deny you to lumber you with an incomplete set that scores nothing. In terms of risk taking, balancing probability and choosing between helping yourself versus sabotaging someone else, Sushi Go is a brilliant and cheap introduction to a lot of really popular board game mechanics you'll find in much bigger, more complicated games. Number seven, The Mind. Ah, The Mind. A few years ago, everyone was playing The Mind, and not just because it's cost effective. The Mind is less of a game and more of a thought exercise, but no, come back, it's also really fun. It's a co-op game where each player is given a number of cards from a deck numbering 1 to 100. You start at level 1 and everyone gets one card, then at level 2 everyone gets two cards. Are you with me so far? No one knows the numbers on their friends' cards, and no one can speak. 
at all. Then, in total silence, you all have to put down your cards from lowest to highest until they're all gone. But Adam, how can we do that if we can't speak? That's the joy of the mind. You will fail. You will fail a lot. But somehow, over the course of many games, you'll begin to develop an unspoken language. You'll be able to tell stories with eye contact and sing ballads of your cards using slight shifts in body language. It's genuinely fascinating to see a hive mind be created around a silent table till Marcus wangs it up again because Marcus can't connect to anyone because Marcus cannot know human love. A beautiful, tiny game that absolutely conquered the world. Number 6. Rhino Hero We all like Jenga, but as someone who once worked at a board game cafe, f**k Jenga. Yeah, shout out to all seven of my board game cafe workers watching this who have my back. Am I right? Point is, Jenga is loud. It is so loud. It is so loud so often that I still have dreams of those blocks clattering to the table like a volley of machine gun fire. Rhino Hero is Jenga, but with cardboard, and thank God for Rhino Hero. In this very simple game, you build a tower for this Rhino Hero. Look at him, about to go off and fight crime in an attempt to impress his kids who are taken in the divorce. You've got a hand of roof cards, and you play them one by one, making sure you bend and arrange walls underneath it in the formation laid out on that card. If you run out of roof cards, you win. If you cause the tower to collapse, you lose. And best of all, when the tower goes, because it's made of cardboard, it goes silently. Please, when you next go to a game cafe, play Rhino Hero instead of Jenga. You too can save a life. Number 5. Love Letter For a while in board gaming, micro games were a big deal. Small games, small price tag, quick turnaround. For the most part, they were too lightweight to make a big impact, but not so Love Letter, the success of which almost launched the micro game trend by itself. It comes in this delightful drawstring bag, and it's basically just a deck of cards. Each go, you take a card, and you play a card. Either you play cards to eliminate other players from that round, or when all the cards are gone, you have to have the highest number. That's how you win a round. First to a certain number of rounds wins. That's the whole game. It's teeny, but what makes it fun is that each card you can play has a different fun power. Guards allow you to eliminate players if you can work out who they are, barons can big league other players out of the game, and the prince looks like Brad Pitt for some reason. It's a fun collection of powers that bounce off each other really well. Each round takes a really short amount of time so you don't get bored. It's very light, but perfect for playing on a train, if you have a spare 10 minutes while you're waiting for food to arrive, or in the waiting room before your hysterectomy. Number 4. Hanabi Some games are about conquering the world. Some are about bankrupting your peers, and others are about working together to make a pretty fireworks display. No matter what you like, board gaming has you covered. Hanabi is a co-op game where you play as, and I'm directly quoting the rules here, absent-minded fireworks manufacturers. What an ace trio of words right there. You get a hand of cards, which you need to play in a certain order, five different colours of cards, numbered one to five. You have to play a red two on a red one, a green four on a green three. You know how it goes. Here's the trick. Unlike a normal card game where you're the only person who knows what's in your hand, in Hanabi, you turn those some bitches around so you're the only person who doesn't know what's in your hand. But you're the only one who can play your cards, which means your friends need to spend these blue information chits to give you one bit of information about one colour or one number that's in your hand. For example, you can say to Sarah, you have three greens in your hand. Or you can say to Mo, you are like a parent about to spring terrible news about how their kids are going to spend their summer holidays because you have two twos in your hand. Using that information and only that, you have to try and place your own cards without making too many mistakes or, as is the case with most absent-minded fireworks manufacturers, everybody dies. It's a wonderful little puzzle that works as well with two players as it does with five. Number three, Uno. Is Uno too simple and classic to recommend to people starting a board game collection? I mean, maybe, but I played my first game of Uno when I was 33 years old. You heard me. Also, Uno's Twitter account went viral recently for having the audacity to try and clear up their own rules, which people were having f***ing none of. So yes, let's talk about this very cheap and very fun game. So, pack of cards, four different colours, zero to nine. When it's your turn, you can either play a matching card, number, or symbol from your hand, or one of these, which is a card only played by assholes, Laurie. If you can't play, you pick up a card and you carry on until someone's played all their cards. It's so simple, and God, you can just play 20 games of it in a row if you're not careful. It's been home ruled almost to the point of being a broken game. You can't stack, pick up twos, and pick up four cards, and please stop playing with the rule that you keep drawing cards until you find one you can play. It makes the game last eight days. But if you play by the rules themselves, it's actually more nuanced, quicker, and more strategic than you 
remember. For example, a rule that a lot of people forget is that you can choose to take a card even if you can legally play one from your hand, which adds a level of bluffing into the game. Some, like me, have dismissed Uno for being too light, but I was wrong and for that I'm sorry. Number two, no thanks. No thanks, aka the motto of 2020, is a tense little bastard and I love it. So in the box you get a deck of cards and some tokens and also so much chewy game. On your turn, you are given the option to take a card. If you don't want to, you say no thanks and pop one of your supply of tokens on it and the option then passes to the next player. And it keeps going like that until either someone chooses to take the card or doesn't have any tokens left and has to. Crucially, when you take a card, you take all the tokens that come with it, which yes, you might get a bad card, but it can give you more escape options in the future if even worse cards come up. When you take that card, it goes on the table in front of you and will give you that many points at the end of the game. But here's the thing, you don't want points. Points. points are like carbs or crabs, you just don't want them. At the end, the player with the lowest score is going to win, but here's that extra wrinkle that makes this one of the best small games ever made. If you chain cards numerically together, you only have to take the points for the lowest card in that chain. For example, if you have a 13 and a 15 in front of you at the end of the game, that's 28 points. Oh no. However, if during the course of that game you can find the 14 card, suddenly you've linked them and now it's only 13 points at the end. Hooray! But if that 14 comes up, will someone else steal it before you can get it in order to screw you over but also lumber themselves with 14 horrible crabs? Or will they give you a card you really want and lose one of their tokens in saying no thanks? This game has so many tough choices, it rules so hard. And number one, Six Nymphed. An abstract German card game about numbers and also silhouettes of bulls for no reason? This thing sells itself! But no listen, Six Nymphed is one of the best card games ever made, period full stop, which also means period. It is so tense and mean and makes you feel relief and hatred and joy and I can't get enough of the little sod. Everyone starts a round with a hand of 10 cards and four communal face-up cards on the board. Everyone takes one of their cards and they're all played at the same time. Then from lowest to highest played, they simply go next to the card in the middle that they're closest to while also being higher than. That creates these rows you see here easy. However, if you're the person that puts down the sixth card in any row, you have to take the whole row. These cards then go off to one side to be counted at the end, and like no thanks, represent points, and you hate points. F you crabs. The board is constantly changing, which makes your choice of next card to play anything from swaggeringly easy to agonizingly risky. And with every card you play, your original hand of 10 shrinks down and down, reducing your options and making it more stressful and so much more glorious when you survive having to take cards yet again. Man, it's so hard to convey to you how much this game makes you feel because it's just some numbers and bulls. But that's the good point of this list. This game costs less than a tenner. So if you're even slightly interested by my praise for this, the greatest pub game I think you can buy, that is a relatively cheap gamble for potentially huge returns. And that's our list. What are your favorite cheap board games? Let us know in the comments. Don't forget to like and share this video around. And please subscribe to Phenomenerds for more amazing lists, explain videos, and get on board.